Hello, everyone, and welcome to a, um, what is going to be a very interesting webinar. It is by our first repeat guest speaker, uh, Christian Olsen from uh, SubC7. We're very happy that he has uh, he's agreed to come back this time to talk about um, suction piles, the design of suction piles using um, Optum G3, first and foremost, but there's also some uh, G2 analysis. So uh, Christian is a uh, principal engineer at SOPC7 and um, some of the applications he's, he's working on, I, I guess on a daily basis more or less, is uh, these suction piles, the design of these suction piles, which is a really interesting uh, area of application. So um, the um, webinar will be about 30 minutes, I think, and that'll be followed by a Q&A session so we have the button, button, the Q and A button at the uh, at the bottom of the screen. Click that, and um, and you are welcome to type in any questions that you have, and we will um, then take them at the end of the presentation. So um, that's it for me, and I will uh, hand over to Christian. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I'm very very glad to be the first. Uh, person here, external person to go with a second webinar. So uh, it's a great, great honor. And especially in these days where we can't participate in, in nearly anything else. So I'm, I'm very pleased. So I have a presentation here for you for um, some uh, suction pile design that we've been working on lately. And I think I'm sharing the screen. Yes, you're sharing yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. So the title, the Suction Pile Foundation Design and Optum uh, G2 and uh, G3. And um, I'll first just give a small introduction and then talk about template design with the uh, suction piles. Then we did a uh, interesting project lately where we recovered some uh, suction piles. I'll briefly talk about that. And uh, then just uh, some benchmarking for suction pile uh, design. So yeah, for those who have uh, been here before, I'm uh, currently a, a principal engineer at Subsea 7. Uh, I've worked at Multiconsult, a company in Norway as well. And uh, before that, I've been a discipline manager in Subsea 7. Uh, had a position as part-time lecturer at Stavanger University for some years. Um, I've been involved in a few uh, papers, but not many. Uh, and uh, last year, I won uh, Inventor of the Year. Uh, in Subsea 7 for, for submitting uh, eight patents. Um, and um, Subsea 7 then, uh, what is it we do? So Subsea 7, we are a company for the, uh, mainly for the oil and gas industry, but also for renewable industry, for example, wind turbines. And um, more or less in the oil industry, we are installing uh, structures and pipelines uh, on the uh, seabed from uh, our own vessels. Uh, which is kind of seen here on the graph. So on the picture, we can see some of the Subsea 7 boats uh, installing various equipment, uh, pipelines, uh, templates, and so on. Also, there's a wind turbine over here. Um, I think it has recently been announced that we have won a very large contract in uh, Scotland for installation of wind turbines. So that will commence uh, immediately. Um, so that's more or less what we do. I normally say that we install yellow stuff on the seabed, but it should have been pink. Pink is more visible, but uh, I guess uh, yellow is uh, it's just looking better maybe on the, on the vessel, so I'm not sure. So first case today is uh, template design with suction piles. And um, I'll come with an introduction and uh, some examples from projects uh, and uh, results and uh, then a bit of discussion in the end of, of uh, this part here. This is the first part. So um, templates. Um, the picture here is uh, showing a template on the back deck of uh, one of our boats. Uh, it has uh, four suction piles. And in here, you can put the equipment um, for the wells, Christmas trees, and manifolds, and so on. So the template basically goes on the seabed and is uh, the direct connection to the wells uh, down below. And then uh, from there, you will have uh, pipelines going over to a platform, a floating platform or a fixed platform. So, so the template is the thing that connects the wells to the platform uh, via, via pipelines. And um, typically a template 
weighs 250 tons. So uh, the weight is quite uh, significant and also the size. So we need really large uh, vessels to install these. And, um, um, and the weight is quite important because if you need to select a vessel with a larger crane, then the cost for this uh, increases a lot. So it's quite important that we get the weight down as, as much as we possibly can. Um, the case study I've selected here is a, a template. Um, it has uh, four suction cans called C1 to C4. Uh, there's about 12 meters by 18 meters center to center uh, for these cans. Um, this one is uh, located in uh, soil conditions, uh, very soft clay over soft clay. Um, the governing load case uh, in this one is uh, from something called a bob, which is a blowout preventer. And uh, that one is placed over the well that is currently drilled. So uh, the, all the load is dead weight, uh, but it's not distributed equally to each foundation. Um, the clay and steel interface in this case is selected as uh, 0 0.58 according to uh, DNB. And the uh, unfactored loads are given here in the table where you can see that the, the suction can C1 has the highest, highest load given to it. Yes, there's most dead weight on this one, 2,221 2, kilonewtons. When we're designing templates as uh, this one, there's, uh, there's two uh, methods that you use. One of them is called skin friction only, uh, which means that you ignore that there is a top plate uh, and uh, water is assumed then to free, flowly, uh, free, uh, uh, free flow uh, in and out of the suction can. And uh, that uh, is a very um, uh, high requirement. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll show that later. Uh, the, other the other possibility is that we, um, we use uh, the base plate also to take weight. So the uh, figure here shows uh, on the right side that you also have bearing capacity than on the bottom of the suction pile. This gives a substantial higher capacity. Uh, of the of the suction pile, so it's basically the same one, but it all has to do whether um, whether you allow water to flow through or not. Uh, many clients typically uh, want the uh, friction only uh, solution. So um, first, if we look at the template and we do a individual design of uh, these, um, I've in this case chosen to use an internal software in uh, Subsy Seven. Uh, developed uh, by us. It does uh, installation analysis, retrieval analysis, and capacity is assessed with a stability envelope. And on the right side here, you then see the stability envelope. So there are two curves here. So this is horizontal capacity, and here you have vertical capacity. And um, this curve here is for uh, if you only have the skin friction, then the capacity is roughly 2,500 kilonewtons. But in the event that you allow uh, the end bearing to be included as well, the full area of the suction pile, the capacity is uh, four times more uh, above 10,000 kilonewtons. So in this case here, we can see that the dead weight uh, included a partial factor is exceeding um, the capacity. I think I forgot to say the size of the suction can, sorry. No, that's not included. I think the, uh, the suction can in this case were six meter by five meter uh, diameter. Um, so as we can see, there's a, there's a very large difference between these two. And uh, we can see here that we are exceeding the limit. That means the suction can needs to be increased in size to meet uh, this criteria. Um, however, um, I then try to uh, build a model uh, in Optum uh, G3 where I um, make um, the suction piles with no, uh, no cap on. So uh, they've been created just as, um, just as shell elements. Uh, I used the uh, Tresca soil model uh, with a gradient profile and um, maybe a bit too large soil volume, uh, 60 by 60 by 15 meter. Um, the suction piles are then made by the shell element. It's a 12 prism and uh, the interface of 0 0.58 is then used uh, and the tension cut off. 
the least loaded suction piles are then applied the, um, the load directly. And then the highest loaded suction pile, I've uh, used a multiplier load to then find out what is the actual capacity of this one. So the, the point here is that if that one fails, then there will still be some uh, capacity coming in from the other bending in. Um, there is just a small uh, bot here. That is, um, the structure needs to be proven to be rigid enough that it can distribute the loads. So if the structure is very flexible, it probably can't distribute the load. So you need to make sure with your structural team that it's rigid enough to be able to re, uh, redistribute the loads, which is a, um, a check that they'll do for you. So if it's rigid enough, you, you can do this model. Uh, in this analysis, I then choose to use uh, lower, lower bound uh, mixed element and uh, the upper bound element. Uh, then I made uh, four iterations from 1,000 to 10,000 elements. Uh, the total runtime here is uh, actually, in this case, it's surprisingly high. It's nearly 20 minutes uh, on, on most other um, problems where I use uh, four iterations. The, the time spent is significantly uh, less, but close to 20 minutes for, for, for this one, uh, which is three different analysis uh, with up to 10,000 uh, elements in the adaptive mesh. Um, some of the results are seen here. Uh, this is the result from the lower bound, and I think this is the mixed element, where it's, it's seen that um, the structure is tilting uh, towards this uh, pile over here, where it, um, uh, the, the other ones are as expected. They're dragged down with it at the same time. And you can also see that the, the soil inside is moving freely, so it's kind of pressed out of the suction can uh, during failure which of course is not going to happen in, in reality because there is a, there is a lid on. Um, so the results, the, the lower bound is anticipating that this pile uh, has a capacity of 4,600 kilonewtons. Mixed one is 4,800 and uh, the upper one is um, uh, 5,000 kilonewtons. So rather than designing it to the 2,500 kilonewton capacity, where I then needed to actually increase. Um, I would, if I followed the single suction pile philosophy, I would need to increase my size of the uh, suction can. But instead here, uh, by, by looking at it as a whole, then I'm able to uh, reduce the size in fact. So rather than going up in size and maybe ending up with a larger vessel, I'm going down in size and maybe we can pick a, um, a smaller vessel for, uh, for this case. Um, so that's quite significant. So here we have 10,000 elements. That gives us a 7% difference between upper and lower bound. As I said, uh, this, this problem here was, um, was quite time consuming for Optimus, 20 minutes for, for the three uh, different ones. Uh, so it's, it's a very complex problem for, for Optimus to, uh, to look at. And as I said, by then assessing the system capacity rather than the single pile capacity, um, we can then reduce the uh, the size here in this case, and and maybe that can uh, enable us to use a smaller vessel, which will um, uh, dramatically uh, decrease the cost. Maybe it wouldn't. Maybe it would be the same vessel, but uh, it's it's possible that uh, that something can be saved here. Um, we currently don't hold the uh, the newest, I think, version of G3, but the one we have um, doesn't have um, adaptive meshing. Um, in the uh, in the interface, and um, maybe if if uh, I had a newer one, then uh, maybe it would run a bit faster. Uh, I'm not sure, but um, it's it's a it's a difficult problem, uh, that's for sure. But nevertheless, we 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 got a solution to it here. Um, so the uh, second case I'll present today is a recent project we had, where we um, recovered uh, uh, a number of structures. Uh, with suction case, uh, suction piles. Uh, the picture here shows uh, one of them being lifted on the back deck uh, during operation here. So I'll just uh, give an introduction to the problem and then I will uh, share some uh, offshore observations. And uh, this problem here, we, uh, we choose to uh, look at this in uh, Optum uh, G2. And uh, then I'll have some uh, conclusions in the end. So, um, on this uh, recent project, we, uh, we, we recovered um, 
several structures. Um, the picture here shows a protection structure with uh, four suction cans. Um, they had been in place for roughly seven years. And um, we uh, both pumped out the suction piles while at the same time also having the crane in constant tension. So we're lifting it up. And um, um, afterwards, we, uh, as it came out of the seabed, we uh, experienced that there was a 10 centimeter layer on the suction can. Uh, some of the clay has, uh, has fallen off here, uh, but you can kind of see uh, clay being stuck on here. But as we are lifting up uh, this, the structure to the deck, then some of the clay is falling off. So on the deck, we see uh, some of the clay has fallen off. And uh, the case is then uh, a bit uh, investigating what's going on here. Um, so first, this, this picture here shows that the, the layer was uh, roughly 10 centimeter thick. It was uh, quite continuous over the suction piles. You can see it on both the pictures here. And uh, the weight of this soil, uh, or, sorry, the weight of the structure is, is uh, very well known. We installed it, it was lifted before uh, putting it in place, so we know the weight. There's some marine growth, uh, but the soil weight here, that is uh, quite unknown prior to uh, recovery. And in the present case, we saw the 10 centimeters, and uh, that's potentially a 100 uh, tons additional weight when you recover this structure. Um, so if you don't account for that, you could end up in a bad place uh, when you come and pick it up. If the crane all of a sudden doesn't have the capacity to lift it back on deck because of these additional uh, tons. So therefore, um, we want to try and see if we can predict the soil that's uh, stuck on this uh, suction pile. And uh, to do that, I, I got some help from Christian here building a uh, uh, Optum G2 model. Uh, it's a axisymmetric model. And um, in this case, we then picked a zone with uh, 10 centimeter of clay uh, on both sides. And um, this is because we are anticipating that the clay in this zone may have a, a higher strength for some reason, uh, since it was stuck on the uh, suction pile when we uh, got it up. Uh, you see on the model that there is a, a green uh, surface load applied. And that's then the pressure we applied in the pump uh, that's uh, located uh, on the inside of the suction pile, but not on the outside. And then we put a multiply load on the suction pile, dragging it up at the same time. A number of element is uh, roughly 1000 and uh, the soil model we used here is uh, Tresca, Tresca soil model. Um, so, uh, I'm actually, there we go. I don't, I don't know. Uh, just move myself over here temporarily. Um, so we're using two under and CS strength. We're using the under and CS strength, uh, the, um, the kind of orange soil um, as uh, SU1, and then we're using a um, SU2 along the, um, this interface, a 10 centimeter wide uh, on both sides here, uh, the green zone. If we have um, SU1 and SU2, if they're the same value, so if nothing has consolidated uh, and it's not remolded anymore, it's regained full strength. Then what we see in the model here is that the, the, uh, the plate actually lifts uh, straight out. It doesn't take any soil along with it. So if we were to assume the soil strength along the skirt has the same strength as the intact soil, we would most likely see that the plate would just uh, slip along this uh, interface and we wouldn't recover any soil. So then we, uh, we made another model where we uh, assumed that the, um, S, uh, the soil close to the um, skirt had a higher strength than uh, SU1. And uh, if we make that, then we see uh, two things. First of all, we see that the soil is in, is in fact stucking onto the plate and uh, will be recovered. Uh, we're also seeing that the, uh, the soil inside um, inside the suction can actually depress uh, and uh, will plastically deform downwards while the soil outside will remain at the same level. Uh, so I have some pictures here uh, from uh, offshore campaign afterwards and uh, they actually show uh, that the soil has in fact been, uh, been pressed down inside the suction can during recovery. So um, 
so that kind of validates a bit the observations we, we found here, that uh, the suction pile uh, did take up this uh, soil volume and also that the seabed was depressed, uh, compressed in, inside, or not compressed, but pressed downwards, yeah. So there's some conclusions here. So uh, of course, it's not fair to, con uh, to, to compare it to uh, the DNV uh, recommendations, but DNV is saying that after two months, we should have a, um, a strength in this interface of uh, between 0 0.58 and 0 .50, uh, 65 um, along the interface. And uh, of course, this, this template has been uh, in for, uh, for seven years. So it's of course not fair to, uh, to compare to that. But our, our finding here is though that uh, the strength must be higher than one in some sort of zone. Uh, in our case, it was uh, 10 centimeters. And um, so, so the strength must be higher than uh, in, intact strength. Otherwise, uh, the skirt would have left the ground with no soil on it. We are having some ongoing work to try and see if we can uh, make a better model to predict the thickness of, uh, of this layer. Uh, this is just the initial work. Um, should anyone in the webinar have any other experience with this, then uh, I wouldn't mind if you, uh, if you would pass it by uh, and, and, and share that uh, with me. That would be uh, nice. Uh, send Jürgen an email or something and uh, we'll, we'll get in touch. So I think that was, um, that was quite interesting to see that uh, we had some observations offshore and we, uh, we were able to model it initially. We'll see if we can make a better model. And also we saw that the soil inside was uh, compressed uh, or pressed downwards. Uh, we saw that as well in the model and, and uh, while offshore. And um, my um, last example today is a benchmarking on, of uh, suction piles. Uh, so, so I'll just uh, do an introduction here and talk a bit about the case, uh, the modeling analysis, and then, then just some discussion. So um, suction piles, um, we saw examples where they're used in templates. They're also used for wind turbine foundations. Uh, floating platforms can have uh, suction piles as uh, anchors, uh, riser bases for platforms, and uh, initiation of uh, pipelines. This is some examples of where they're used as a single suction pile. Um, I'm benchmarking this towards a uh, Plexus Bulletin from 2008, where the capacity of a suction anchor with a diameter of five meters is uh, looked at with a length of uh, 7.5 meters and a uh, very soft clay, 0 0.1 plus 1.25 uh, set and uh, a gamma of five, uh, five set kilopascal and an alpha of uh, one. So it, the, um, the illustration over here also shows there's a 300 kilonewton load on it. And then there's a, there's a load applied in, in a certain angle here. So um, first of all, of course, this is a bulletin from Plexus from uh, 2008. So it's 12 years old. So uh, there's been a lot of development in uh, Plexus uh, 3D since then. But at the time they presented um, four different models. Um, so a Plexus 3D model, which was half the problem, uh, an NGI method, and I uh, oh, don't know if, um, an NGI model here, um, general purpose uh, fine element program, um, and uh, something uh, with an equivalent area in, in 3D of a rectangle and uh, uh, another NGI model. Um, we see here that um, the range uh, is, is, uh, is quite narrow. So I think already back then, uh, this problem was uh, quite well uh, modeled and, uh, and the difference weren't all, all that great between the various models. So in this case, I've um, made a 24 prism uh, suction pile and uh, a, um, also a soil volume, which is a prism. Of course, uh, I should half this problem and uh, just look at uh, half the problem. So uh, you could do it much faster, but uh, I, I don't know. I just know myself and whenever I go and do something smart like half the problem and you have to click all the boundary conditions, then I know I get one of them wrong and then I need to spend longer time. So it's just easier for me since uh, you always do a mistake. So I, I just enjoy better just do it uh, the, the simplest way. Um, so Tresca soil model, 
uh, used with a profile uh, function, of course. Uh, the soil radius here was 25 meters and the depth of 15. And uh, no, no tension cutoff is uh, used in this case. Um, I used a, a mixed and upper and lower bound element and uh, three iterations from uh, 1,000 to 20,000. So in this case here, you can see that the, the runtime is only uh, 12 minutes, which is uh, much, much faster than uh, the more complex model I showed earlier with the uh, open-ended uh, uh, suction piles. So um, here you see that uh, Optimus is, is giving you uh, results a lot quicker um, for, for a problem where it's, it's not as complex as the other one. So, so 12 minutes and 15 is, is, is not too bad. Uh, results from the different elements, uh, lower bound is uh, 1785 and upper bound is um, 1940 and, and mix is uh, 80, uh, 1870. So there's 8% difference. And uh, with this, you then get a feeling of how accurate you are. And um, this also compares quite well actually with the 1870 from uh, one of the other uh, examples in the Plexus Bulletin. So. Uh, um, I think that's that's quite good. So the, the advantage you get here is that uh, you do get the upper and lower bound and the mixed element. So you can kind of see um, that there's a plus minus uh, 4% on, uh, on, your, on your bounds here. So this analysis was uh, much faster. This is uh, 12 minutes up to 20,000 elements, which is uh, double the amount of elements I, I used in the uh, previous uh, example. And as I said, I could have halved the model uh, and uh, it could have run even quicker, but uh, I tend to get something wrong with the boundary uh, condition. So I just don't do that. Uh, the model was really easy to build. Um, would be, uh, of course, interesting to compare to uh, 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 the new version of, uh, of uh, for example, Plexus and see, see how that compares, but I, I haven't had time to do that. Uh, but it's good to have the uh, upper and lower bound, so you get the uh, kind of a, a sense check of uh, your analysis. In this case, it's uh, plus minus four uh, percent. Maybe we could have used more models, uh, more elements, and, and got a bit closer. So um, I think that's uh, that's what I had. Are there thank you very questions? much, Christian. Yeah, thank you. That was um, very nice, and uh, we are on target uh, time-wise. So. Um, we have some question al questions already. Uh, interfaces, we can start with that. That's a very important part of this whole thing with uh, suction piles, obviously. Um, maybe you want to say a few words about that, Christian? About interfaces. Um, um, yeah. So, so, what so, is the interface? Oh, oh okay, yeah, okay. So um, the the idea with the uh, with an interface element is that the uh, the strength between um, uh, the uh, the soil and uh, some material is um, is not the same as uh, the material strength. So the interface will have a different strength. If you have a a sand and a steel plate, for example. Uh, the friction between sand and uh, soil is not the same as friction between soil and soil. So the interface has a different uh, property. And in some cases also um, for suction piles, some, sometimes you will have a tension cutoff. So if there is um, between the, uh, the plates and the soil, if, if it can open up, you need to allow that in your modeling. Uh, that has a huge impact. If, if you actually have a failure mechanism with a skirt that wants to leave the soil, if you forget to implement the interface, then you can, you can be in some problems. Yes, that's that's what I, I would like to. Can I, if I can just add something um, to that, uh, Christian. Um, so when it comes to these types of Tresca type materials, let's say cohesive materials, um, there are there are basically two decisions to be made with the interfaces, and those are what fraction of shear strength do you allow for um, relative to the soil shear strength. And then <clears throat> that's the first question. So that's specified uh, via a factor between zero and, and one, where, where zero would, is what we usually call rough, and one, uh, or one is what we call rough, and zero is, is corresponds to smooth. So there's no shear strength at all at the interface. And then the question is uh, the second question is whether you can allow for tension to develop between the 
pile between the shell, between the structural element and the soil. And, and usually you, you can't allow for that. So um, you would specify a tension cutoff. And, and that's um, really quite straightforward to do with the program. These interfaces are um, very robust and they are also very um, quite rigorous in the sense that things are really done in the, um, let's say the correct way, especially when it, with respect to the tension cutoff, which is something that sometimes is handled in, um, in something that may be handled in, in, in slightly different ways. Um, but where we um, in, in Optum have a really sort of good and robust way of, of handling that. For those of you who are interested, I'll just share my screen. Um, this is from the this is from the G2. Ah, okay, I can't share my screen, but the, uh, in the G2 manual, there's a, in the examples manual, there's an example 27. It's on page 100. Um, and in that example, the different sort of interface conditions that would be relevant are, are described in, in quite a bit of detail. Um, so, uh, and it's the same interfaces we have in, uh, in, in G3. So that was a that was a long answer for a for for, for a short question. There was a um, another question here about the uh, the model uh, model here. It's a, it's actually a good observation. Uh, can you see the screen now? Yes. Then here, there's uh, someone saying that the pile seems to be um, rotating individually. Uh, which is also correct, but uh, what you can't see in this uh, illustration here is actually that the the, the, the structure is uh, going downwards at the same time. So you 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 can only see the soil volume here, um, but it does look like the piles are individually rotating. But that's that's actually uh, uh, kind of correct. But it's because the structure is is leaving the soil behind. Um, that's why. Okay. A question I'd like to answer is Optum applicable for offshore wind foundation design like suction buckets, mono or jacket? The answer to that is absolutely yes. Um, we will have a webinar on that really quite soon. Uh, definitely on, on monopiles, which is something we've, we've done quite a bit on. Um, so again, that's a shell. Um, in a way, similar. I mean, the, the dimensions are different, but the geometry is not too too different. The basic geometry is not too different from a um, from a, a suction pile. The loading is different as well. But yes, uh, the program is is definitely applicable to that. Um, there's one here who's asked if uh, the impact of the wells are uh, assessed for the foundation capacity. So I'm I'm not in entirely sure what's just meant here but uh, when you drill the wells down you will put in uh, something called caissons which is uh, uh, big piles with uh, concrete around them so these ones are connected down uh, several kilometers in the ground and they they kind of have infinitive uh, capacity typically you want to try and design the template so it it doesn't rest on sub uh, on top of these uh, foundations on, on top of the the caissons um, but sometimes the settlements are so large that you, you can land on the caissons. Uh, but ideally, you should, you should uh, design them uh, not touching. Yeah. And a question I would like to answer as well. Um, can we model reverse end, bearing, reverse end bearing due to suction in the software? Yes, that's something I actually looked at uh, a little while ago. Um, so if you pull it out, what then do you have any, um, what happens at, you could say, the base of the, of the pile? Um, if you don't specify anything, you will get some end bearing. Um, but you could also, if you want to avoid that, put in a, an interface down there at the base of the pile to have it basically pull straight out so that it's only the friction at the sides of the pile that contributes to the to the capacity. And so there's quite a bit of flexibility in, in that kind of modeling. There's one who's asking how the uh, uh, how the structure between each suction pile was uh, was the model and, and here just uh, had a, a rigid uh, shell element uh, going between. Um, 
and and since it's up at the top uh, of the soil then uh, it really doesn't have much influence of uh, of the failure here uh, you saw in the model that some of the soil is uh, moving but the most of the capacity comes deeper down as as the soil is increasing with depth and uh, and also there will be um, there may be uh, steel members laying on the seabed as well Yeah, Christian, there's a, there's a, there's a question on the uh, issue of the recovery. The, the clay there stuck at the sides of the pile. Um, is that a result of clay remolding during installation? Is it a question of the hydraulic conditions being very different on the, potentially on, on the two sides? Um, what, what is it? Is it consolidation? after installation we've discussed this and and maybe you i don't know if you have anything more to no we we are we're, we're currently trying to investigate if it's uh, some sort of consolidation and if we can uh, somehow uh, model it um and find out what what's going on that's that's what we're currently doing um but it's it's um, the strength must be stronger than the intact strength um so um so the strength has increased for some reason in, in this uh, 10 centimeter zone. And um, likely it would be consolidation, I think. Yeah, and, and there's, a, there's, a, there's a question, is this a total stress analysis with the Tresca model? Yes, that is exactly what it is. So, and there was another question on, on, on whether we model the dissipation of pore pressure. And the answer to that question is no, because it's, First of all, it's a total stress analysis. It's sort of an, uh, an undrained um, analysis in a total stress framework. So um, there is no dissipation of pore pressures during, during the loading here, you could say, of, of these piles. So it's, it's relatively rapid loading that we are assuming um, relative to the time scale of the pore pressure dissipation. And then uh, how do you find the bearing capacity using the software? Well, at which point of analysis will you know where, when you're at failure? Well, that's the beautiful thing about limit analysis because you never have to make that assessment of when the displacements are large enough for you to be able to say that you are probably at failure. This is not load displacement analysis, it's, it's limit analysis, which is one quick and direct analysis to get the limit load without actually having to trace the full load displacement curve from, from say zero to, to failure. Um, so that's really a, a, um, quite, an, a, quite, a, quite a convenient thing that you set the analysis running and then the result of the analysis is your limit load. You don't have to make any assessment of, of how the load displacement curve looks. Uh, and as Christian showed as well, that there's a possibility of computing the so-called upper and lower bounds meaning that you can bracket the true solution from above and below. Um, and then there's these so-called mixed element, which gives a result that's, that's somewhere in between. And this in between is, of course, uh, where the exact solution is somewhere in between. And the mixed element tends to give you really a good um, estimate of, of the exact solution. So, um, so that's, that's how that is. <clears throat> There's uh, one asking here if uh, if clients are increasingly asking uh, how much soil is going to be stuck on on these foundations when we recover them, and uh, we I, I would say I I don't know um, that really because we we're not uh, recovering that many structures uh, currently, uh, but um, I think it's a fair question from the clients how much soil is going to get stuck if if the template weighs uh, 250 tons and you end up with 100 extra tons. Um, uh, of weight, then uh, we need to, to in, in, include that in our um, in our planning for the choosing the vessel. Yeah, and as a question as well, could could it could this uh, um, problem be a result of a chemical reaction between the steel and the clay? And I know you mentioned that as a possibility, Christian, some time ago that uh, it could be some sort of rust formation that would then uh, drain the clay close to the close yeah. to the. Um, I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure yet, but uh, I think uh, rust would not, 
take enough water from the soil, but it, it's possible that the, that the rust formation would, would suck out something. I, I don't know. I'm not a material engineer, unfortunately. But uh, that, that was an idea we looked at. I, I don't know if it's possible. If someone in the chat uh, knows, then uh, please send, send us an email. Yeah. Um, and about the models, so um, this is a Tresca. This is the Tresca model you have used here. And that's, of course, the model you would want to use sort of for fine-grained materials um, when doing undrained analysis. I think it's more or less kind of an industry standard, right, Tresca. Um, there is the possibility as well of using various other models that should be somewhat uh, similar to the Tresca model, but, but they should be somewhat more accurate. And we have the AUS model, the anisotropic undrained shear strength model, and we have something called the generalized Tresca model as well um, that come with failure envelopes that tend to match experimental data better than the, the standard Tresca criterion. So um, there's a webinar on that, on the AUS model. Uh, it should be online on, on our YouTube page. So if you were interested in that, I'd, I'd suggest you check that out. And then, of course, there are models for, for drained analysis as well. So C5 type analysis um, for, for, for sands and, and other sort of coarse grained materials. Uh, so they're there um, as well. I guess most of the work you do, Christian, in sub C7 is it's often um, very soft clays there at, at the, um, on the seabed. Yeah, in the um, in the in the North Sea, uh, most projects are are for very soft clay uh, at at the seabed. Uh, uh, in other regions of the world, you can have uh, different uh, materials, but um, and also you you'll find sand sometimes, uh, but that will normally be at a more shallow water depth. Yeah, and how did you model the structural the uh, plate between the suction piles? Was it was it with a rigid shell element? I think I think it was yes. Yeah, that was a rigid uh, shell element. Um, there's uh, one one person here who's arguing that the the soil uh, strength uh, during um, during installation is going to be a bit different inside and outside. The the reason is inside, then you you'll be pumping. And uh, there's a pressure sucking sucking soil up, and that's not the case outside. So there's there's some different uh, mechanisms going on with the uh, installation, um, which affect possibly the cell, soil strength differently on the inside and outside. In in the present case, we haven't looked into that in in too much detail. But what we did see in the analysis here was that when you have it pressurized inside, and and uh, lift up the skirts, then the inside soil did move downwards. Uh, that's what we saw uh, both in the uh, model and uh, we also saw it on the pictures from the uh, recovery of these uh, structures. So the soil inside had moved down whereas this, because of the pressure inside the suction pile to recover it while the soil outside hadn't moved. So um, there is some different mo uh, movement here and you could, you could probably find out that uh, the soil strength remolded afterwards will be remolded differently and the, the strength will also be differently. Yeah, yeah. Just a, a, an, an interesting question. Um, so when it comes to all, there's a comment that when it, for offshore wind developments, um, allowable rotations, allowable displacements, so the whole, let's say the SLS is, is also very important. It's not just the ULS and uh, how does um, the G3 and the whole feeler Fine development limit analysis methodology, how can that be used for that? Well, I'd say the ultimate capacity can still be assessed with limit analysis, but usually, and I agree with very much with the comment, usually that's not really sufficient. You also want to know something about the um, deformations prior to failure. Um, so then you're in the um, domain of elastoplastic analysis, and that can be done with um, G3 as well. So, but you might want to, so the way that we have used it is to um, do a limit analysis to get a feel for where you are in terms of the ultimate limit load and then um, 
continue on with your elastoplastic analysis to determine also the stiffness at at relatively uh, low levels of loading, which is which is also important. But that's an elastoplastic analysis, which is which is also available in G3. Um, this one asking if uh, the installation of the suction piles was also uh, model in Optums. And uh, as I said, uh, this project here is uh, uh, was seven seven years uh, old, uh, or they had been in place for seven years, and at that time we didn't really have Optums. But um, installation would I would not uh, do that in uh, Optums. Uh, Subsy Seven has their own software uh, where we are we're looking at the installation phase of it. Um, so that that's a that's a different calculation. Okay, yeah, I would say to model the installation in with finite elements is going to be very uh, challenging. Um, yeah. So um, it would be really nice to be able to do that, um, but um, we are not quite there yet uh, with, with that. So that 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 that's normally either programmed in a spreadsheet or, or you can you can make some software that uh, that do it. Uh, that's uh, it's it's not a uh, it's uh, not that complex. I think we are a lot of questions here. Yeah. Uh, the VH envelope, how do you obtain that? Uh, that's obtained from some, um, some papers uh, who have, um, who have um, uh, done a series of um, finite element and then come up with an equation uh, to determine this uh, stability envelope. It's, it's kind of like what's in the code for bearing capacity. Sure. Uh, but if of course, that, to... one could, that, that one could easily also have been made in uh, Optimus, of course. Yeah. So you, you would apply an inclined, uh, one way of doing it would be to apply an inclined load and then yeah. um, find the ultimate magnitude of that inclined load. And then you have the V and H components and then you, you sort of do a swipe from whatever yeah. zero to 90 degrees yeah but there is a paper available um i don't remember at the top of my head i think it's uh, some uwa paper uh, where where an equation is proposed for for this uh, stability envelope okay And there's one uh, proposing that the excess pore water pressure uh, is, is, of course, key to understanding how this um, strength develops over time. And, and um, that, that's what we're looking into now, but I, I think that's about right. Uh, and that's also our prime, uh, that's our sus uh, suspect. Sure, sure. Um, Good calculation speeds. Um, so that's with the Tresca model. If you wanted to use a, a more Coulomb model, yeah, you would have the same speed, more or less, in, if you were doing limit analysis. If you're doing an, doing an elastoplastic analysis, well, yeah, you would have the same speed, more or less. Um, so each load step would correspond to a kind of limit analysis. The advantage with this approach here is that we can we can take relatively large load steps. There's no real limitations on the magnitude of the load step um, to sort of ensure that you have convergence. So typically, if you want a relatively sort of smooth curve, you might want to have 10 or 15 load steps from, from zero to, to failure. So, so that's also kind of uh, pretty, pretty snappy. I see um, here this. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, go ahead, Christian. Um, there's uh, one here asking if the four template buckets, if they were installed uh, applying suction or it more or less sink in by a submerged weight only. And um, that, that project, as I said, it was seven years. We've recovered it last year and before then it was seven years, I think, before it was installed. So it's eight years ago. But I actually think that it penetrated uh, nearly completely by self weight. I think we only sucked it in uh, the last uh, one meter. Uh, but I'm I'm a bit sorry. I can't remember in complete detail. But I think it's uh, it did that. Yeah. 
So I think it's the last one meter we only sucked it in. There's one asking if we try different thickness of the stronger clay in the zones. Uh, we are we are we are going to uh, put some more investigation into this problem now and uh, and try to come up with something more uh, more scientific than what I presented today. I think the presentation today was uh, maybe a bit limited on on this uh, subject. Giving uh, we we are investigating it. Yeah, yeah. The ten centimeters uh, is a good point. I mean, the ten centimeters was was an input to this model, right? So we, yeah. uh, that yeah. should, of course, be a result of, of yeah. any model, any reasonable yeah. model you would come up with. I have some pictures where you also see the inside. And uh, also on the inside, there was uh, about 10 centimeters stuck on the inside. There's uh, one asking here. So, so we also saw something similar, that uh, there was about 10 centimeters on the inside. Uh, I have some pictures. Um, And there's a there's a question from um, from there might be a late comer. What software are you using? The software is called Optum G3, and uh, that's the 3D version. And then there's Optum G2 as well, and it's Optum CE, Optum Computational Engineering dot com. Um, you can download the programs from there, both of them. Okay, I think I think that's. That might be more or less it, Christian. Um, yeah, I'm just going to see unless, if... Unless there's a last one here, a final one. No, I think that's um, most have been answered. Um, if someone maybe feels that question was not answered sufficiently, I think they can maybe forward it on to Jürgen and then I can, I can see if I find a time to, to answer it, um, if, yeah. uh, if that's the case. Yeah, yes. but, uh, yeah. but I'm very pleased to, uh, to have uh, been invited for a second time. I think this was, uh, this was really great. Um, more than 40 questions here. Uh, <laughs> so the interest has been uh, quite good, I think. Yeah, thank you very much, Christian. And, and thanks for all the, um, the questions as well. Um, much appreciated. So we will have another um, webinar in a couple of weeks on pipelines. So uh, details uh, on that will be sent out soon and um, I hope to, to see you again then. But thanks for now. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh...